Hello, this clip will introduce you to the sources of international law. When we speak of the sources of international law, uh, we speak of the origins of international law. Huh? So where does international law come from? So if we first uh, look to the, international, uh, to the domestic level, uh, we see that it is quite clear where domestic law comes from. Uh, a, an act of parliament, a, a bill is uh, made by the government together with the states general, so the, the two chambers. Um, so where does international law come from? Well, in international law, um, we focus not so much on the place, uh, so the institution, but rather on the process. So we identify certain processes of authoritative decision-making, the products of which uh, create uh, legally binding obligations. So Article 38 of the ICJ statute uh, lists the most important sources of international law. Uh, we have uh, conventions, uh, we have a treaty uh, a custom, and then we have uh, general principles of international law. Those are the three main sources of international law. So, um, at the basis of all three of these uh, processes is uh, state consent. And the idea is that uh, all sources of international law are in a way expressions of state consent to be bound by particular obligations. So let's look at these sources in turn. Uh, we begin with uh, the most important one, uh, conventions or treaties as they are more commonly uh, referred to. We find a definition of what constitutes a treaty in the Vienna Convention on Law of Treaties. Um, and you find the definition on the slide. There is a special knowledge clip on the Law of Treaties, so I will refer you to that. Um, there are two different kinds of treaties, and it's useful to make that distinction. So first we have lawmaking treaties. Those are treaties uh, that are prepared uh, very often by the International Law Commission, a group of international experts, and they then come up with a first draft of a uh, text. This uh, text is then further negotiated by uh, representatives of uh, yeah, the states of the international community. They then agree to a text uh, which can later be ratified by states individually. Then we have uh, contractual treaties, uh, which are of a very different kind. Those are treaties uh, made by a two or a handful of states, and they regulate particular issues of interest only to those states. So here you see uh, the Netherlands and Luxembourg conclude a treaty on the avoidance of double taxation. Uh, another source of international law is custom. Again, there is a special knowledge clip on custom, so I would like to refer you to that. Uh, a third source of international law is a general principles of law. Um, and there are two kinds of such principles. We have uh, general principles that are common to all uh, legal orders, and those are mostly derived from uh, domestic legal orders. And those are principles that, um, without which no legal order can function. And they are often transposed, uh, mutatis mutandis, from the domestic legal orders onto the international legal order. And so here you find some examples of such principles, without which no legal order can properly function. And then there are also principles that are unique to international law. And those principles are often derived uh, from more specific rules. So we look at uh, various treaty rules or customary rules, and then we identify an underlying principle that sort of unites or binds those specific rules. Uh, the function of these general principles is to ensure the, the completeness of the international legal order. And so uh, to avoid a situation in which no custom or treaty is applicable, and then the judge would be uh, forced to pronounce a non licet eh? So I cannot give a decision because no international law is applicable. And general principles are, uh, exist to fill that gap. Um, other sources of international law have been uh, suggested eh, besides general principles, custom and treaty. For example, um, binding decisions of international organizations. And then often reference is made to uh, the binding decisions of the UN Security Council, United Nations Security Council. 
But the bindingness of those decisions is derived from the UN Charter, uh, which then would be the source of uh, the legal obligation. Uh, soft law is also referred to as a candidate. Uh, uh, soft norms, soft law norms are norms that are contained in a legally non-binding document. And the idea is that they, they are sort of a test case and uh, may, maybe later they will crystallize into uh, uh, sources of international law, either through the process of customary lawmaking or by conclusion of a treaty. Um, another candidate is uh, judicial decisions. And then often reference is made to the uh, judgments, uh, the case law of the International Court of Justice. But the uh, statute of the ICJ itself uh, makes very clear uh, that decisions of the International Court of Justice have no binding force except uh, to the parties for, in, in that particular dispute. So no stare decisis in international law. Of course, these judgments uh, are considered highly authoritative in uh, their interpretation of existing international law, but they are not creative of new law. Uh, then what we also have is the teachings of the most highly qualified publicists. And then uh, being a Dutchman, I of course think immediately of the works of Hugo Grotius, which indeed had a huge influence on the development of international law. But uh, to think of uh, Hugo Grotius as a person uh, able to dictate uh, what states ought to do, how states ought to behave, um, yeah, that of course does not seem to be correct. And uh, already a long time ago, uh, objections were made by a, uh, a, an English judge in a judgment. Um, uh, objections were made of the immense influence these individuals had on uh, interstate relations and obligation. And, and uh, in the today's world, uh, the highly qualified publicists have even less influence on international law as in the past. So I would not consider them a source of international law. Um, thank you for your attention.